G'day everyone, Greg Canavan here with Ryan Dins. Ryan, how, how's things, mate? Yep, pretty good, Greg. How you going? Very well. Now, today uh, we are talking about Ethereum. You just put out a very detailed report on the world's second biggest cryptocurrency. Uh, I thought it was really interesting from a, I guess, a novice's perspective. I hadn't really understood Ethereum, what it was all about uh, before. So uh, really enjoyed reading the report. And for those listeners who haven't read it yet, uh, I, I do recommend have a, have a read of the report before you listen to this, because this conversation is really to try to expand on that report and give a little bit more context and detail around that. Uh, so I guess my first question is, um, maybe just to give a little bit of a, a background on, on Ethereum in the same way you did as a report, you positioned it as, um, you know, Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency that came out in 2012. And then there was a bit of experimentation with altcoins, but then the main altcoin that sort of surfaced in 2015, I think you said was, was Ethereum. So maybe just give a little bit of background on, on how that came about before we sort of get into the, the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah, so um, so the story to Ethereum is actually quite personal for me because I got into Bitcoin about 2013, 14. <laughs> now, Bitcoin obviously was in the wild since 2009. Um, but no one had really heard of it outside of the, the small community of Bitcoiners until about 2011. So I was a couple of years after that. And when I got into Bitcoin, it was basically just Bitcoin. There wasn't like a crypto industry as such. It was just Bitcoin. And it, you, could, you could still, I think, when I first got into Bitcoin, mine it from your home computer. Like it was, it was that early. Um, and then when I first got into it, there was like a cycle where Bitcoin went from like, you know, $20 up to $1,000 and then came back down to, you know, 200 bucks. In that cycle, um, 2013, there was a bunch of uh, altcoins started coming out. There had been a few altcoins in the past, um, but there, there, was, there was a few more came out in that 2013, 14 cycle. And what an altcoin basically is and was at the time was someone looked at Bitcoin's code, which is open source and you can see it and said, right, well, that system is fine. But how could we tweak it to do something different? So there's all these experiments, like some, some um, altcoins tweak the supply. So I think there was one, I think it was called un Unobtainium. <laughs> all it did was reduce the amount of uh, tokens to be released from 21 million down to a million. And, th and their whole pitch was, hey, if you thought Bitcoin was scarce, how about only having a million? But everything else was Bitcoin, right? And look at the time that was interesting. And you know, those, you know, the usual hype cycles where people thought, oh, that's a good idea. But then it yep. didn't have the intellectual backing of Bitcoin, so it faded away. And there was early experiments in uh, I think I even invested at the time in a in a, a special token set up for Navajo Indians uh, in America, um, you know, Native Americans who who were, sounds sounds solid. <laughs> like, at the time it made sense to me. I thought they're, they're gonna create a token. <laughs> And they have these reservations in America, which mostly have casinos on them. And I thought, well, well they could create their own token and, and maybe they'll make people who want to gamble go to casinos use this token. So I thought that was a good idea. I can't remember the name of it right now off the top of my head. But, um, but th all that stuff was happening in 2013, uh, 14. And then there was a crash in the Bitcoin cycle. And there was from 2014, there was a big, you know, if it went all the way from $1,000 per Bitcoin down to, I think, $150 around about the low. And in that time, a lot of those early altcoins just died away, just like what happens in the usual cycles. People come yep. up with a great idea, but there's no real intellectual backing behind it, and then they fade away. So during that time, Bitcoin was trundling away. There was still development. I was still really interested in it, but most of my focus turned into Bitcoin at that time. Um, and then in 2015, again, zero interest in the crypto markets. The, the prices were doing nothing. But in 2015, Ethereum came out. And Ethereum was interesting even back then um, because what Ethereum did, it wasn't just tweaking a minor thing like you know the supply of it or, um, or uh, who could be a node operator. It was actually uh, increasing the capabilities of what could be done on a blockchain. Um, so if you remember, a blockchain is just a decentralized way of verifying that the state of the market is true. Um, and Bitcoin's really good at doing that, but in a really simple way. So Bitcoin can only tell you, hey, I want to transfer you some Bitcoin. And by signing my private key, I can confirm to the network I have the ability to do that. And the miners and the node operators can confirm that, that my private key was the correct one for my public address. And that's all basically Bitcoin can do but really well and really efficiently and with a really good economic system behind it. But what Ethereum said was, why can't we allow it to do more than that? Why can't we add certain programming capabilities to not just say, 
hey, you can transfer money to them, but maybe we can add um, extra capabilities to say, if I can do that and this happens, then maybe that happens. So you're adding that next level of programming, which they ended up calling smart contracts. And the idea is you could create lines of code which could self-execute. Now, anyone who understands programming realized that that opens up exponential possibilities. And the, and the first idea that Ethereum enabled was pretty simple. It enabled other cryptocurrencies to launch on their network. Um, and so when Ethereum came out in 2015, it got a bit of hype and it got a bit of traction, but it was it, um, basically created the bedrock for what ended up being the 2017 crypto boom, where we had heaps of cryptocurrencies launched. They all launched on Ethereum because Ethereum was allowing them to do stuff that they couldn't do on Bitcoin. So that right. was so that is what makes Ethereum an interesting cryptocurrency beyond just you know another nameless altcoin. It was adding capability that Bitcoin couldn't do. And what it was essentially doing, I don't know if I used this analogy somewhere in the report, but it was like trying to become the app store, basically, and therefore enabling all this innovation to be done on top of it, which you know you can do that on Bitcoin, but it's harder to do, and Bitcoin, by 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 design, doesn't change very fast. You know, in recent years, it has added some you know new capabilities, but that's you know four years of debate to change one thing. And, and you do get innovation on on Bitcoin, but it's just a lot slower, de deliberately so. What Ethereum did was you know just created this uh, exponential um, potential for developers, and that's what's been happening since 2017. We've seen. You know, heaps of altcoins launched on Ethereum. Most of them live on the Ethereum network. Not all. There are, as we say in the report as well, there are now competitors even to Ethereum. Um, but that was the um, that was basically uh, why Ethereum was not just any other altcoin. If that makes sense. So you've got um, the way I sort of look at it. You've got Bitcoin sitting here as the uh, supreme digital gold um, store of wealth version of of a cryptocurrency, and and that just lives essentially on its own. Then you had Ethereum that was built not to compete with, with Bitcoin, but, but as a platform that would allow, I guess, the flourishing of more uh, of, the, of the cryptocurrency network and, uh, uh, or ecosystem. And I suppose that is almost the foundation for this decentralized finance industry that we're seeing now, right? Because a lot of these cryptocurrencies that are built on the Ethereum network, they're providing a lot of these solutions um, in the in the decentralized finance world. Is that the best way to think about it? Look, a lot of the, the crypto industries that have evolved, like decentralized finance, like DeFi, like uh, blockchain assets and gaming, like the idea of tokenized securities, you know, having having shares, stocks and shares that are on the blockchain. And um, that is all on Ethereum at the moment. Now, that might sound um you know, like, oh, well, that's better than Bitcoin. But you have to remember that to do this, Ethereum has made some trade-offs. Yep. So you don't get a free lunch with blockchain technology. The reason Bitcoin has stayed slow and clunky to a degree is because it has prioritized decentralization above all else. And the lack of complexity is actually a design feature. It's not a bug because they, they, they want to make sure you can't hack the Bitcoin blockchain. And that's proven true over 12 years. You know, it's secure, decentralized, and that's the main features. Everything else, like you know, being be able to do fast transactions or being able to do more complex transactions, it'd be great if they could be done on the Bitcoin blockchain, but only if in a way that doesn't compromise those first two things. Whereas Ethereum said we are basically going to go hard and fast. You know the old Silicon Valley uh, mantra of uh, go fast and break things, right? Which it's fine and it does encourage development, but in Ethereum's history, there's been multiple hacks of various projects built upon it. There's even been hacks of the Ethereum network itself, which is not something that's really happened with Bitcoin. Uh, I remember in 2015, I think it was, or 2016, just a year after Ethereum launched, um, they, they created the first DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization. And that was a big deal at the time for Ethereum. But there was a bug in the code to do that. And about I think it was about $300 million worth of funds was, was locked by a hacker. The hacker broke into it and the fear managed to lock it. And, and so there was a big debate at the time, well, what do we do with these funds? And what actually happened was Ethereum rolled back their blockchain and recovered those funds, uh, which if you think about the idea of a blockchain, it's meant to be immutable and no one should be able to do that. They mm. made a conscious decision to fork the blockchain, which, which is what it's called, uh, and 
move that that ETH Ethereum back to the address as it should be. A competing project uh, said that was wrong and it's called Ethereum Classic and that kept the original chain. So that let the hacker keep the, the funds, but they kept Ethereum Classic tokens, not Ethereum ones. Now, I remember that it happened at the time, the price of Ethereum plunged from $20 to $12. And I think I was in at the time and that, that seemed like a big fall. And I think I even sold my Ethereum at the time because I thought, well, that's that experiment not working. Yep. You know, how, how can you survive that? But the lesson there is that, you know, the crypto industry forgives a lot of mistakes because now we're, we're not at $20, we're at $4,400. So <laughs> I've learned yeah. over the time, you can't be too fast to react to these things. But the point being um, is that Ethereum itself, but also the projects that, that live on it are more susceptible to hacks, bugs, and other stuff. And, and that's why many like diehard Bitcoiners are um, against it because they say, well, you know, we, we are going slow because we're taking 30 years of research and doing this in a proper way. You guys are just playing fast and loose with other people's money. And, and how can you have a multi-billion dollar network uh, with these bugs and, and things like that? And Ethereum's response to that has been at the foundational level because there is an Ethereum foundation. Like there's not a Bitcoin foundation, but there is an Ethereum foundation that has a bunch of money that, to pay developers they have upgraded Ethereum and changed it at a fundamental level all along the way. Um, the, the big change they're doing right now is in moving the consensus mechanism from proof of work, which is the, the same way that Bitcoin works with miners that spend electricity in order to su secure the network to something else called proof of stake, which is how in the report you generate your income because you stake your, your, your Ethereum tokens into a smart contract, which basically means lock them up for a certain period of time. And in return, you get newly minted Ethereum for mining the Ethereum network. Whereas on the Bitcoin network, if you own Bitcoin, you can't mine Bitcoin. You have to have you know a powerful computer on a cheap electricity su supply these days. So that's a big change. It's almost like a new token Ethereum will become. So that's just one change. But there's been many of these uh, changes happening to Ethereum over time, uh, which you, know, you can look at that two ways. It's a positive in the sense that they're developing and they're trying to make something better using the latest technology at the time. Or you could look at it in the way Bitcoin is look at it and say, well, how can you build a stable ecosystem when there's just constant change and constant complexity? How can you risk you know, trillions of dollars, which is what Bitcoin wants to be able to do, on a system that is inherently shifting at the foundational level? I've not got a firm opinion on that. I can see the, I can see the points, the both points of view, but there's something to be aware of with Ethereum. But isn't it, that's a, that's the the long term trade off with these uh, projects, right? I mean, if you if you want a purely decentralized network, then uh, at the moment, I don't know whether technology will change down the track, but at the moment, uh, you sacrifice transactional speed and and volume uh, and, and speed of volume for that. So Ethereum is is trying to be the the platform for decentralized finance to grow on it. So therefore, it, it almost has to sacrifice some. Um, aspects of uh, decentralized blockchain in order to provide the the transactional speed to allow that to happen, right? Exactly right. So you, so as long as you understand that trade off, then that's fine. That's and that's why I tried to do the comparison with Bitcoin and Ethereum because it's not comparing apples with apples. You have to understand the differences. And look, that was my journey into crypto: understanding how Bitcoin worked first, and then seeing how every other project worked in relation to Bitcoin because that's the easiest way to understand it. So when you look at a new project to say, well, right, how decentralized is it? How secure is it? Who can mine it? What's the token economics of the for the token holders? Um, what happens? Can they roll it back? Is it is is there one overarching power? How was it launched? Who who owns all the tokens? And you can look at all that by comparing it to Bitcoin. And and I'm not saying it makes it any better or worse, but at least you can understand the trade-offs that have been made. Now, the problem Ethereum's got that Bitcoin doesn't have is once you open up the possibility of trading off something to make something else better, then competitors can come in and, and make more trade-offs to make it even better. So yeah. for example, in the last year, there's been a bunch of competitors, a big one's probably Solana, which came out from nowhere. And it's basically, it says it's a blockchain, um, but to run a node, which is the most basic thing you should be able to do on, on a blockchain is actually very hard unless you've got a lot of memory in your computer. As far as I know, there's not that many miners um, you know, validating the network. And I think they've got plans to make all that stuff better. But at the moment, it's, it's all pretty centralized. 
But what they can do better than Ethereum is they can do super, you know, high speed transactions. They're basically designed for high frequency trading and they can do it really cheap, much cheaper than Ethereum. So from a competition point of view, Ethereum is stuck in a, in a, in a little bit saying, well, they've sacrificed too much, but can we attack that? Because we know that we sacrificed a little bit to get away from Bitcoin. So they're trying to find that sweet spot. Now, I don't want to talk Ethereum down too much in, in that sense. I just want to explain that, you yeah. know, there is where, where, where do you work out where the line is and what you decentralize? And to be honest, Ethereum is still very decentralized compared to, say, Solana or, or IOTA or a bunch of other competitors. And the good thing with their development is, is they are working on ideas to scale the, the, fu- the foundational level of, of the blockchain that could be released in the next few months that add these really cool new technological capabilities that have been researched on for years to the blockchain and make it cheaper and make it faster. And, you know, if that, if that comes off, then suddenly these competitors here suddenly look out in the dark again, because Ethereum is more decentralized. And if it's just as cheap and just as fast, then that suddenly they're out in the, the cold again. And, and that might just be the part of the hype cycle we're in, you know, where Bitcoin yeah. goes that through that sometimes where people go, oh, Bitcoin, you're too slow and all these projects rise. But then over time, you know, Bitcoin's like the the, the tortoise and the tortoise and the hare. It yeah. plods along and it becomes a part why it works. And I think to a degree that will happen with Ethereum because you, you can never forget that most of the developer talent is working on Ethereum. Like, well, I was going to say, it must have first mover advantage in that respect, right? I hope you enjoyed that preview from New Money Investor. To get access to the full video and much more, please click on the link below.